I define myself an interdisciplinary conservation scientist because I try to bridge different fields of sciences to address some of the most pressing issues about biodiversity conservation uh, globally to locally. I guess one of the most striking aspects that drove me to become a conservation scientist was that when I was a child, uh, my father used to take us to natural areas to observe animals in the wild. And I have memories of lions and elephants in some national park where there aren't any more elephants or lions. And all of these happened during my lifetime. And that kind of like motivated me to uh, take action and, uh, and become a scientist who can help address some of these issues. Of course, as a, a young student, you are very fascinated about animals and their behavior and their natural environment. But soon you realize that there is no option of saving these species unless you uh, understand the surrounding, uh, you know, the people who live alongside the species. And that's why my research is now very much focused on understanding what we define as socio-ecological systems, which are systems where people and nature interact, sometimes in a negative way, and that's where, for instance, poaching of elephants and rhinos takes place, and uh, very positive also, sometimes uh, people and nature can live alongside, you know, where there is coexistence, for instance, where local people are engaged in conservation, they benefit from conservation, and they really understand and nurture these relationships with nature. Actually, it's a very good question. The first memory I have of lions in the wild, I was very scared, I was a very small kid. And they are majestic creatures, they are big. And, uh, as a human being, you understand why our ancestors actually were, for instance, hiding in, in caves where some of the ancestors of, of lions were around. They're really big creatures and they, are, and they are scary. At the same time, they are some of the most iconic species that you can ever see in the wild. And that's why I think everyone should have the right of seeing them in the future, roaming free in the natural environment because they are part of na our natural uh, heritage. We, as humans, uh, lived alongside these species a long time ago, but we, as humans, have now taken a direction which is not sustainable because we are developing at rates which are not sustainable for not only for the natural environment, so for species like lions and beyond, but for ourselves too. We are slowly uh, deteriorating the planet to levels which are not acceptable. And that's why we need to be taking action to making sure that everyone is going to be able to see lions and elephants and butterflies and birds and amphibians and reptiles and plants, you know, in, in the future. Because it's, it's part of our history living alongside nature. And we need to be building those connections again, especially in the, in the current generations. We see that in some places where communities have been allowed to take a responsibility and management of land that used to be part of their ancestors' rights, there we see that we have positive examples where wildlife that was before depleted has come back to very important levels. So, and you know, historically, uh, we've made a mistake of isolating local people, thinking that they were a threat. In reality, they are an opportunity. We need to have more examples where local people become part of the governance of national parks anywhere, especially in those countries where they've been historically displayed from their original land. And that's why conservation uh, can be uh, complicated to some extent because it very many people think that conservation is about animals and wildlife you know and biodiversity but in reality it's about us humans and how we interact with our environment
And we find ourselves in a place like Valbruna, where the connection between people and nature is self-evident. People here have relied on the forest for centuries, for a living, for food. And this is actually also an example of what, you know, a communities in different parts of the world, in different contexts, they can interact positively with nature and that is going to be important for making sure that this planet can recover to levels which are good for our existence as, as a species, as Homo sapiens in the future. Uh, sustainability is, in my opinion, an approach to life you know, from making sure that our daily actions are not impacting on the planet. For instance, in relation to our daily consumption of energy and uh, house heating, but also in terms of how we move around the uh, landscape where we live. Uh, and goes all the way to also try to, to, to take action so it's like locally and all the way to globally in order to be making sure that, for instance, the important forests that are there to be sequestering uh, CO2 are, you know, are going to be maintained or restored to levels that will allow people to uh, be living not under extreme uh, catastrophic weather events in the future. So to me, it's actually you know, something that deals with the philosophy of living. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be giving up on everything that we are doing, you know, in our lifestyle. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be um, giving up on seeing friends in other places. But I think we need to become more responsible towards some of the actions that we are doing. For instance, we could be traveling less by plane and we could also be eating less meat. Uh, and that would really like, you know, making, a, making an important contribution to the long-term sustainability of, of the planet. So each context is going to be very different from one another. But there are similarities. And I think what we need to do is to actually be making sure that we understand what those similarities are across the systems. But also, these contexts change over time. So we need to be making sure that we you know, understand how they're changing and how different systems cope with these changes. And one such change is, of course, climate change. So how are communities going to be responding to climate change in the future? And the context is important because it could be that, you know, here in Valbruna there's going to be increased uh, levels of, of rainfall as opposed to maybe Finland becoming drier or there could be situations where there's going to be uh, increased uh, snowfall or decrease in temperatures. So we need to be, you know, while there are global uh, lessons that can be learned across, which is, for instance, how, what are the socioeconomic variables that affect these contexts. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we understand locally how these changes, changes impact on local people, because ultimately decisions are being made at the local level. There are global policies that can be developed to be addressing global issues, but then it's going to be locally that you know adaptation or kind of like understanding of the context is going to allow us to develop the best strategies to respond to these changes so that's why you know local i always mention the term local people because local people are going to be very important uh, in understanding how to be adapting to to change and i think that we need to be paying more attention in including their views, their preferences into the decision making to inform national to global uh, policies. South Africa is an example where local, uh, local people have been included in, uh, into enhanced decision making, also when it comes to conservation. They've been asked where they wanted conservation actions, such as the creation of national parks, to be going on on their land. And, and this actually facilitates the implementation of these actions, as opposed to 
uh, implementing top-down approaches that don't actually lead to real implementation. And we've seen a number of unfortunately negative cases where decisions have been imposed and then where like you know other issues have, have generated. So South Africa is an example where local people and their opinions are included in decision making at different levels from the municipal level all the way to the national level. Where they wanted conservation actions to be happening on the land or where they did not want to these actions to be happening. So they mapped, for instance, their willingness to accept uh, conservation actions so that not only they identified where these actions should happen, but also which landowners wanted the conservation actions to happen. And this facilitates tremendously the implementation of actions. And you know, in this context, for instance, indigenous people have been historically uh, ignored when identifying areas for conservation globally. We need to be making sure that these people are not only uh, you know, uh, included, but they take leadership over those decisions. And that's why we need to be rethinking the approach that we have you know, towards how the conservation of biodiversity can be sustainable for both people and biodiversity.